We are honored to have uh, both State Senator and President of the State Senate, uh, the Honorable Karen Spilka, here tonight, and also our State Representative Carolyn Dykema. The Board of Selectmen will receive a legislative update from Senate President Karen E. Spilka and Representative Carolyn C. Dykema. And the school committee is invited to the meeting. We're pleased that you both could come. Um, I'd like everybody to be able to hear, be in, hear and participate. So I thought maybe um, Representatives um, Dykema and uh, President Spilka, if you could maybe sit in these two. And I know I have the school superintendent and four members. So I'm, oh, five. five. Yes. No, we need another chair. I was going to say bring one of those threesies forward and we'll have five when you want to. Bring it over you. Oh, there's no microphone. Okay. Then I think we better put you two over here where there's at least a mic. And thank you for coming. All right. Just just as long as you don't feel um Carolyn, Karen, why, why don't you see if this is a microphone? Um yeah, because you need to have the mic. I just don't want the school committee to feel left out with your backs, but speak up and Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody is included and it's supposed to be a joint meeting, so we'll do the best we can. We can scooch it. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you so much for taking time to come and speak with us tonight from your busy schedule, so I'll be glad to turn it over to you both. Well, thank you. Um, we haven't talked about how we're yeah, going to we do this. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, just legislatively, um, you know, I think all of you know, just for in terms of revenue and local aid and, and Chapter 70, just a real brief overview. And then I may just mention a couple of things that, that I'm focusing on. Um, the ja through January, actually now through February, today we got the February uh, revenue numbers that we are... Uh, under benchmark, our revenue is not coming in exactly the way that we would have wanted. Um, most of it is capital gains. Some of it is for budget. So we're trying to be cautious with what we do with uh, funding uh, things to finish up this year as well as for next year. Uh, but we did base um, and build a budget on a 2.7% revenue increase from 19 over 20 which would start this uh, July. You know, as you know, the governor came out with his bill proposal, budget proposal in January. The House will do theirs in April, Senate in May, and then hopefully our conference committee can work it out and have a, a state budget by the end of June. Um, but the state's fiscal health actually remains strong. So uh, we were above benchmark for February, which helped, you know, bring us up. We think a lot of it may have to do with the federal tax changes that occurred that would have been filed in, in December and January, normally under our process and is being extended for several months because of the federal changes. Um, we so. Overall, our economic outlook still remains good. And, um, you know, in talking with the governor, they're not worried yet, or administration and finance, about the dip in, in revenue and <coughs> being under benchmark. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, over the last year, we were able to put $700 million into the state's rainy day fund, so we now have over $2 billion in there. Um, it's great. We have, we have made great strides with that. It's not a matter of if there's going to be another recession. It's a matter, as we all know, when. So uh, that will happen. Um, and, and I can talk about, you know, if you want at some point Chapter 70 or, um, you know, the, what may happen with the, the governor's bill that came out, made some changes with Chapter 70. We are hoping to pass a bill uh, that may, we, we may even get it done before the budget this time. The Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations that would make some changes to the education funding formula um, and take into account the recommendations to fund health care. Uh, for example, in 1993, when Chapter 70 was first done, health care insurance wasn't even a part of the, the state's reimbursement or consideration as to how much does it cost to, uh, to educate our children. 
clearly not only is it a big part, but it's you know strangling school districts, towns, and you know others people you know their budgets across the state. So it takes into account health care, um, ELL students, low income students, and special education, supplementing both in district and out of district, which would help our cities and towns across the state. Um, we're hoping that to get that done, we came very close to doing it at the end of last session. And um, I know that the chairs of the Education Committee have already met and sort of tried to map out a strategy. So that's something that I think would be very significant. It would be the most significant change of the Ed Law um, in the last couple of decades. So, it, and, and eventually, it will help Hopkinton with increased funding as well. Um, so, so you know, there, there's that. Um, I won't necessarily go into all um, that's happened. The chart, the uh, the special education funding that is a part of it would help. That would supplement the special ed circuit breaker funding that we have made an attempt to fully fund the last few years. This past for 2019, it is at the full 75 percent that helping, you know, all of the schools and, and Hopkinton benefits from that as well. Um, there's other things that we're looking at in terms of charter school reimbursements and, and other areas uh, of funding that will be part of the discussion for school funding as well. I do just want to mention um, as as I look at you know the, the next upcoming session, the priorities that I have in addition to uh, the education uh, funding and making changes, it, it touches on other areas as well, from uh, education to transportation to climate change, and um, looking at housing, all looking towards lasting prosperity for the Commonwealth. Uh, Health care is an area also that we came very close to uh, having a major health care reform and cost containment bill the end of last session, um, hoping that we can do another bill that would make some major reforms and build on what we looked at last year and um, save, save money for not only our consumers but for our cities and towns across the Commonwealth as well. There are some initiatives. We will be looking at that, but that's another uh, major issue, priority issue, that I think that we need to look at, along with the rising costs of prescription drugs. Climate change is another area that I think almost anything that we look at should be looked at to the, uh, through the lens of climate change, whether it be transportation reform, housing, or other issues. Uh, it's something that, that we need to really focus on. And uh, I believe that Massachusetts can be a leader in this area, not only in climate change adaptation and resiliency, but job creation. You know, we, we've started doing it, and I think that we have the possibility to really be a, a job creator. We grabbed it with offshore wind. We were the first on the whole northeast coast, and we've added more megawatts over the years for offshore wind. So the industries from Denmark and some of the other countries are coming here to build their manufacturing facilities here, their headquarters here, their jobs here in Massachusetts, which will be helpful. Um, you know, other areas to, for smart environmental change, I believe we need to be working with our cities and towns like Hopkinton as to what more can we do. It's not just the coastal areas that need the resiliency and the adaptation, it's inland as well. So I think that that's really important. The other two areas I just want to note that, you know, I'm forming a working group in the Senate would be transportation. Um, I've been speaking a lot about that. And after a two and a half hour ride into Boston this morning, it's and almost an hour and a half on the way back, um, it's really frustrating. Everywhere I go, transportation, congestion, traffic is like the hot topic, the major topic of everybody. And we can't, we can't keep putting that off. Um, so we're, we're looking at transportation infrastructure, as well as um, asking the chair of the Senate Committee, uh, the Senate on Revenue, to do an informal working group as well to look at uh, our revenue and, and how can it hasn't been looked at in, in decades 
Um, so what can we do to make our, our tax code stronger, fair, and still provide the services and programs that we want to provide? So that, that's um, just a smattering. And the, la the last thing I want to mention, which is a personal issue for me, uh, is mental health. Um, as some of you know, my father had mental illness, and this is an issue that is very important for me. So I um, really would like to try to work to make making mental health care as routine as we do with our physical care and approach it in the same way, get rid of the stigma, um, and uh, have true mental health parity and insurance for once and for all. So those are, are, that's the overall agenda that, that um, I have at the start of this new legislative session. It's exciting. Um, there's a lot going on. The Senate and the House are, are very busy uh, working with very closely the administration in making sure that we get things done for people of Hopkinton and the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Can we ask questions? Oh, you want to do questions at the end, or you want to do questions now, or? Well, we could take a few questions now and then go to Representative Dykema and then kind of have an all all around. If you have something you'd like to ask. Yeah, I, I was at the uh, MMA uh, last month, and I guess no, it's two months ago now, and they were talking about the Chapter 70. It, now, is any of that passed at all? The, the, the new algorithm? No. Okay. Now, it, it came really close the last night of the session, but um, there's redoubling their efforts. We're starting again, and I do believe that it will pass. I'm hoping this year, not, it, we, not even next year, second year of the two-year session, but I think both the House and the Senate uh, are, will try to get it done this year. It was really exciting to hear you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the changes to, to bring up, you know, adding the ESL, adding the health care, adding the, uh, some more of the SPED stuff. It just sounded real exciting. That's why I was, I, I was hoping that, that that went through. And, yeah. and, and my only other one is, is, you know, keep protecting us on the Mass Pike. Uh, okay, you know, yeah. be, and, and, you know, it, because we, you know, we, we continue to, to foot the bill for every for all the other construction projects. And just like you said, when we want to use it, it's an hour and a half to get into town. Right. And the Southeast Expressway, they rebuilt that beautiful tunnel for all those guys, and they don't pay anything. Right. And I remind Secretary Pollack that very frequently. And when I talk to her about um, the viaduct that they want to build along the Beacon Yard and lowering the pike and raising Starro Drive and fixing some of the train, uh, which will eventually help our commuters, which is great, but it's like an eight-year project. And I asked her, well, how are you going to pay for this? And some of it was through bonding, some of it was through state funds, and possibly some of it was through toll increases. So I said, well, are there tolls for plans for other areas of the state or at the borders? The response was, not yet. So I said, well, then don't count on toll increases to pay for this, we need to come up with alternatives. Or I believe that we should be looking at tolls at other areas of the state and at the borders. Um, Connecticut is looking at it, Rhode Island, some other states. Now is the time where the federal government may be approving states to put tolls on federal roads, and we should be looking into that and applying for that. We could also, we don't need their approval for state roads. So we should, if tolls are such a great idea for the pike and for raising money to fix the infrastructure, it should be a great idea for all of our roads. Because I know it used to be that we can't put up toll boots or anything, but with the... We have the gantries with now. With the gantries now. You know, not that I want anybody saying that John's uh, advocating for... For, for more taxes and tolling and stuff like that, but no, but but you know the the rest it's of fairness. the state, it's fairness. It really comes yep. down to fairness, and 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 why, you know, for the for the past uh, 50 years that uh, we've been paying for for yep. the rest of the uh, the rest of the state. Yes, I've raised that with the governor Thanks for always too. protecting us. Yes. I, know you, I, I think the Metro West delegation is all united mm -hmm. in this, and and we will fight that. So, Great, thanks. thank you. Good. All right, for now. Again, let's go to Ben, <laughs> so we can. So, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Thank you for having us. It's uh, it's See great to be here. And I was I was watching Tim.
killed up up here and I thought it's almost marathon time again. I can't believe it. So exciting time to be here. Um, and I just, the transportation conversation is definitely something that has, has escalated recently. I think the congestion on the Mass Pike has reached new levels. And if you look at um, the statistics that have come out, that, that sort of bears out. And I think one of the uh, downsides of an up economy, it's exciting to have all the jobs, but I think there's also a, a commensurate increase in traffic, which is challenging for anyone to go into town. And, um, one of the things I've been focusing on has been the commuter rail. I know there are a lot of commuter rail riders here in Hopkinton. Uh, I personally have two commuter rail stops in my district, the one in Southboro uh, and the one in Westboro. And uh, of course at Ashland I know is, is used frequently by Hopkinton residents. And uh, we do not have the reliability nor the frequency that we need to have uh, given the economic opportunity here in Metro West and given the number of commuters that we have going into Boston. So I've made that one of my priorities. Uh, I serve on a couple of groups. One is the vision study for um, commuter rail, which is a state uh, level uh, look at what is the commuter rail going to look like in 2040 and how are we going to plan out investments to have uh, a reliable commuter rail infrastructure that um, addresses the concerns that I've, I've heard about uh, lack of timeliness. Uh, we need some new locomotives. So a lot of our locomotives are, you know, 50 years old, well past their useful lives. We've been working to try and get them um, refurbished, and a number of those are starting to come into service now. So we're hoping we'll see some improvements there uh, day to day for the riders. So I think it, along with the Mass Pike, I think part of that solution is to improve commuter rail. So that is very much in the works. Um, I thought I would mention a couple of uh, local things that we've been working on. So there was a senior property tax exemption for here in Hopkinton that I know was passed at town meeting, and we worked to get that passed in the legislature, and that was done, which was uh, great to work with you folks on that, uh, signed by the governor in August of 2018. Um, I also filed, uh, many of you know I'm doing a lot of work on veterans, and I've, that's been since the beginning of my tenure in the legislature, and I work very closely with the VSO, Sarah Bateman, who is a regional VSO here and works closely with veterans. and. Uh, there is a uh, fund, a veterans fund, that allows uh, for certain uses for uh, monies collected through the town to go out to support veterans' needs, one-time needs, um, including uh, oil, for example, and a few other things. And, and in meeting with the veteran service officer, we found that there are some needs, specifically legal cost and short-term rental assistance, that are not currently allowed by the, by the state law. So I filed some legislation that would expand the uses um, of those funds here locally in all the towns. Um, served by our, our VSOs to do that. Um, this is the beginning of the legislative session for us. And so um, Senate President, obviously, on her side, is, is uh, in a very specific role. I just got assigned to four new committees that I had not served on before, one of which is the Vice Chair of uh, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy. And we recently had a visit, as, as some of you may have seen, up to the Eversource facility here in Hopkinton. Um, one of the things that the committee covers is gas infrastructure, which uh, is very important here to the town and obviously a much, uh, is very much on the radar for a lot of folks given what happened in the Merrimack Valley not too long ago and focused specifically on safety and how can we make sure that our gas infrastructure is safe. So. Um, I worked with Eversource to um, get a number of folks up to look at our facility, to familiarize them with what was here in Hopkinton, uh, not only to see the tanks that are up on the hill and kind of see what the safety measures were on site, but also uh, also in my district in Southboro is the, the SCADA facility, which does the oversight on safety for the facility here in Hopkinton. And Chief Slayman came with us, and we really heard from soup to nuts uh, from the folks at Eversource who are managing that safety facility, kind of what happens, you know, how do they monitor safety, how do they respond, how are they in touch with our local public safety officials to make sure the town is well served. Um, and uh, we got a great, great overview of things there. Um, and I've also filed some legislation really having heard um, some concerns uh, more in, in terms of what we can do better to make sure that we are kind of belt and suspenders, making sure that we have as many eyes and ears and oversight on the front lines as, as possible. So I filed a piece of legislation that would provide for more inspectors 
on um, gas infrastructure statewide, as well as to make sure that the engineering oversight of some of these repair projects is what it needs to be uh, and consistently across the state. So I'll be moving that forward um, in the committee um, upcoming. The, um, you had talked about uh, toll funding, and one of the things that we did a number of years ago was to make sure that tolls that are collected on our highways are actually used on our highways to benefit those folks that pay them. Uh, and while we certainly uh, don't appreciate the fact that we're the only folks paying tolls, at least the tolls that we do pay, we want to see coming back locally. And one of those projects is the 495-90 intersection redesign, which uh, is well underway. I just thought I would give a, a quick update on that. The plans are still in the works, and that is um, on the tip and looking to be um, committed $270 million in funding, um, including some of that money from federal resources to do a redesign um, to alleviate some of the traffic and congestion uh, at that intersection. Uh, economically, there's a, a study that's put forth by the 495 Metro West Partnership every few years about transportation nightmare, nightmares in our area, and that is one of them that has been one of them for a long time, so we're glad that we're going to be able to finally make some uh, headway on that regional priority. And uh, lastly, the, the Main Street Quarter funding. Uh, that has been something that's been in the works for the town for a long time, and just wanted to let you know that we are very much keeping an eye on that, making sure that uh, that stays on the tip list for the town, um, and uh, just keeping an eye on it to make sure that uh, that funding is available when everyone is ready to move forward with that project. I want to just mention Aerosource because you brought it up, and um, you know, backing up a bit to say thank you. You probably both remember. Not that long ago, there was a whole issue with Aerosource Gasgate here in town. There was quite a public outcry. I know we reached out to our legislators for their support and their input, and I think the combination of pressures, including pressures from uh, State House, really did make a difference. And as you know, it, it turned that situation around, and they where there was no other alternative, all of a sudden there was another alternative, and, and the situation was resolved in our favor. So we really, really appreciate when that kind of assistance can can be given to us because sometimes an individual community feels sort of powerless. Uh, and I'm really glad to hear of what is currently percolating with respect to Eversource and just want to say and ask for any kind of assistance that can be given at any any level to get these utilities, particularly Eversource, to be more responsive to their local communities because we recognize they enjoy certain broad protections all the way up to the federal level. And, you know, Hopkinton, we've got our LNG. I've been reading issues about Ashland with their problems with the pipeline section going through. You hear what's gone on with, with up in the Merrimack Valley. It all seems to be symptomatic of a, of a large degree of unresponsiveness or feel that they don't need to be responsive to local communities and local concerns because they don't have to be. And sometimes that ends up with tragic results. And um, so, you know, we're all working at this together and we all want, we all want the good gas resources, it's important to us, but there's certainly a price to be paid. So whatever assistance and influence on a number of levels can be brought for this whole region, I, I, it's very much appreciated and, and continuing to be a real need for us. Okay. Yeah, I do want to also mention that we will continue to look into that and work with Eversource and working closely with all of you and the town manager. and. Um, trying to convey the concerns and work with them. Um, we are passing a supplemental budget, uh, and there is uh, a couple of million dollars in there for the Department of Public Utilities <coughs> to have a consultant do a study for the pipeline systems across the state as well in the aftermath of what happened in Merrimack Valley, trying to uh, take one more step to ensure that that doesn't ever happen again. Yeah. <coughs> and, and I think just generally being bringing 
in some way bringing pressure to bear to encourage the utilities to be willing to work with the communities. Maybe their asks are really small in the big picture, but they're important to the community. And uh, you know, just because they don't have to isn't isn't reason not to if it's if it's something that'll make us all coexist a little better. <laughs> so um, definitely. I jumped in there. Mr. Tetstone, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, a couple of comments. So, um, um, Madam Senate President, thank you for finding some time to come out here today. Appreciate that and your busy schedule. Um, you spoke of uh, health care. Um, it's nice to know, so we as a, as a board have our eyes on health care. Um, it's nice to know that statewide that you have your your eyes on it and, and that you're actively working on that it's yeah. a it's a crazy um, it, 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 it's just it, almost unregulated um, just the, the expenses are insane uh, I followed that uh, Martin Scarelli all those hearings with Martin Scarelli and, and Trey Gowdy and and that drug that he that he's put up 56 fold or something like that and um, you know, if it's if if we're pushing back and you're pushing back, and nationally it's pushing back, it's on everybody's radar, and there's a good chance that it'll, you may not stop it, but it'll definitely slow it down. Yeah, we um, worked with the Millbank Foundation for almost two years, and they connected us, and we actually went like to Minnesota, middle of December, a blizzard. We're there in Minnesota, meeting with a lot of the healthcare folks there. And we, we went to several of the other states to hear what they're doing, how they're controlling costs, um, how they're making some changes to both private health care and Medicaid, came back and continued to explore it and uh, ended up passing a pretty comprehensive health care reform bill. Um, the House did one as well. Again, we came close. There are certain things that we have trouble, like with some aspects of prescription drugs, we can't totally control the cost there, but we believe that we can be doing more and we can be making, for example, the like we have for the health, health insurance companies, they go to the Health Policy Commission to justify their rate increases, that we can do something similar for the drug manufacturers here in Massachusetts where they have to be more transparent and open about their costs and what they are charging for their pharmaceutical drugs to, to help control the rising costs of pharmaceuticals. And there are other things. We, we've looked at telemedicine. Uh, that can really help control the costs where, particularly in the rural areas, make the tele, telemedicine more, more uh, available. And looking at ways to use either a new sort of, maybe not an EMT, but something like that for preventative, they're finding for example, several of the states found that by allowing some of the EMT-like services, people get out of the hospital, they go home after a heart attack or some cardiac episode, they get pains, they immediately call the ambulance. As soon as the ambulance is called, they have to go back into the hospital. They're there for a few more days. The costs go up. If they have somebody that goes to their home that very day and then the next day, uh, the costs uh, that, that are saved are just amazing in the long run. It really helps control the cost. So even sometimes little things that turn out to be big savings. So a lot of these things we're looking at and other more uh, intense areas as well. Um, and you touched on the mental health. <clears throat> so I'm a nurse and I'm a nurse and I'm a manager for a rehab that um, I work in the Alzheimer's unit, um, very heavy in the mental health aspect. I'm also, uh, for seven or eight years now, a nurse at the maximum security prison in Shirley, uh, laden in mental health issues. <clears throat> so I can tell you that the stigma of mental health is certainly not today what it was X amount of years ago. You know, it used to be. If, so, if you found out that someone was on Prozac, you'd look at them with a, you know, with a raised eyebrow. And it's, uh, socially, I think it's being very much more accepted, recognized as a true affliction um, where mental health issues can, can be as, as common and prevalent as the flu. 
Um, unfortunately, just generally not as temporary as the flu. So I think with your work in the State House um, and uh, knowing that it's hit you personally, you know, it, it's uh, obviously a lot of my uh, comments are, are health care derived because that's kind of what I know. Um, so it's a, I, I certainly appreciate all the work that you're doing on the mental health aspect as well as Thank the health care. Any ideas, please pass them on. No, you don't They're want all welcome. <laughs> you don't want my ideas. You're smarter than me. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning when we're talking about the mental health, the related is the opiate um, crisis, which hasn't come up, but is um, you know, still very yeah. much on the front burner. If you look, look at the statistics, um, you know, it's, it's a, a long road to get, get beyond some of these dramatic numbers about deaths, and now we're seeing a lot more of the fentanyl. Um, and even now the car fentanyl, which is even, you know, 100 times more powerful than the fentanyl. So, you know, looking at it on the treatment end, the mental health end, the recovery end, at the same time trying to stem the tide of a lot of these, these uh, synthetic drugs coming into the market locally. So we really, you know, pretty much approaching it from every angle possible. And what's been um, kind of an eye-opener for me is the, the way that this problem kind of goes out into the community and now we're talking about children yeah. you know who are being Im impacted by the trauma of having parents or who are um, overdosing in front of them and then they're going to school and so it really does have very wide-ranging community impacts and as we know it's everywhere you know it's not limited to any any community it's in every community in every state and uh, I would say that this is going to be something we're going to be coming up you know session after session trying to find new ways and looking for new ideas to deal with it and to support communities locally as they try to work from the ground up. Yeah. Um, I know the last couple of years we've gotten um, some funding in the state budget for local uh, groups right. to be able to do a lot of the local work in the community, working with families, trying to address this stigma issue to, to help people talk about it, right? Because if you can't talk about it, you can't get the help that you need. Yeah. Right. We were able to get $75,000 for Hopkinton Organizing for Prevention Program and then another 75000 for the Substance Abuse Prevention Program at the high school, which, you know, is a great start. And, and they, both of those programs do great work, um, and, and they're leading the way. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to support them with that. So w working in the prison, <coughs> um, the... At SUSA, at the maximum security, Bridgewater is not equipped to handle maximum security inmates. So any mental health issues, any <clears throat> drug issues, any detoxing, things like that, that has to be done in house. So I have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of firsthand um, knowledge on on that. Uh, that when you said the synthetic drugs, that K2 is very very prevalent in the prisons, and it's the most insane. It turns. It, it turns from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, or vice versa, however that works. But um, it's, it really is it's amazing. I don't consider it a disease. I don't consider it, and that's my personal opinion, I don't think that the opioids is a disease. I think it's an affliction. Um, I've had many arguments with many people about it, and it's my opinion. And you, know, you can't go to the street corner and say, give me a syringe full of cancer. Um, that's a cancer is a disease. I think it's a horrible affliction, and it, it hits everybody on every social, economic background. It doesn't matter if you're loaded with money or you you have none. It hits everybody, and it, it's a it's a very tough tough disease. So, um, I mean, tough. Sorry, tough affliction. Um, well, that's why I do think that that attacking the mental health side more uh, robustly will help. I I don't think all opioid addiction or addictions are stemming from mental health or mental unmet mental health needs, but I think a lot of them are. So if we can meet the mental health needs of our residents, hopefully that will also cut down in addiction issues. Yeah. And for, um, for Carolyn, um, it's nice to see you throughout the year at, at all the veterans events. <laughs> um, you know, I've had the pleasure to sit with you at the last couple at the, at the gun club and uh, just it's, it's just nice to see your presence out there at every community thing, it seems, that goes on. And you're just there. And uh, you're a very, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're a treasure. Uh, I certainly love having you around. Uh, it was nice to speak with you at Bob LaVoy's funeral. Um, you know, it's just, it's nice to, to know that you're there. And, and if I need to send you an email, 
I get a response back. And I'm not saying that I don't get that from you, Senator. I just, I just generally have more conversations with, uh, with uh, Ms. Dykema. Um, so I just want to say thanks for all the work that you do for our town. Both of you, thank you for the work that you do for our town. And uh, keep up the good work. Because if you don't, we're going to hold you to it. <laughs> Um, we have a post public <coughs> hearing for 745, so what I would like to do is just open that and then put that aside for a few minutes if the applicant is willing so we can continue because I don't want to, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to come. I'll make a motion to uh, open the public mm -hmm. hearing for the underground propane storage by uh, Faith Community Church. That's not correct. Yes, th this is a, a public <coughs> hearing relative to an application by Margie Selman on behalf of Faith Community Church to store five 1,000 gallon tanks of LP gas underground. Fire Chief has approved the required permit. This is an amended license for underground propane storage for Faith Community Church. Um, it, may I have a motion to open the hearing? So moved. And second. <coughs> second, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, that's unanimous. Is there a representative from the Faith Church here? If you don't mind, uh, we'd just like to finish with um, Representative Dykema and Senator Spilka and then proceed to the public hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So, all right, all so right. I'll, make, I'll make mine quick. <coughs> We're speaking about the, uh, the fentanyl issue. Um, you know, there is a uh, Thermo Fisher has this uh, device. It's an optical device called TrueNock, and I was just wondering if if, if it's possible to look into that, so that our, just like our public officials now have this have the stun gun, so that they don't have to go to lethal force. This is just something that uh, it's it's an optical device that they just aim it at a at a uh, baggie or something, and it can tell them what it what they what the uh, substance is before they even touch it mm -hmm. because that's what it's called true narc by true thermo narc. fisher and it's it's been out several years and, and uh, many of the communities around us ha have it and it's, it's not a very expensive item but i just think it's one of those things that um you know considering that the, the new fentanyl that's out that's just so frightening for uh, public safety officials right. and um uh you know, just like this, it's just another another tool that they can you have to uh, protect themselves. And my only other one is um, back to uh, uh, Eversource and the and and the relationship with the DPU. You know, and whenever we push back, they hide behind the DPU and and they get a carte blanche. You know, when we're talking about repair projects, how you know, just like when when one is repairing a building or a home at a certain at a certain uh, dollar value uh, percentage of the home, all other things kick in. When you talk about commercial, that's when you have to make make it a, a building accessible and such. And um, you know, I was just hoping that something like that might be able to be enacted with um, with Eversource when they're doing a major repair, sort of like what they were doing before. They were saying, "Oh, it's just a maintenance," but in actuality, they, they totally changed the, the 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 whole place, just so they wouldn't have to abide by the new federal standards. But at some point, we want to make sure that, that they're not using 1950s and 60s standards, that they're going to the ones that, that are more generally accepted nowadays. And whatever, whatever pressure you can, you can bring to bear, because again, thank you for the two of you for helping on the gas gate. Meeting in, in your office was just wonderful, and I think that that sent the message that, that the two of you were behind us, and it, and it really worked. So again, thank you for that, and, and, just, and I hope that the, a similar thing can happen with our relationship with, the, um, with Eversource. Just be a, a community host agreement, something, if they could just come to us and work with us, because we don't ask for a lot. We just want to be safe. One of the things that I know we at that same meeting, I think we had talked about this um, lack of, of DPU oversight of this particular gas infrastructure. And um, one of the provisions that I did add to this gas safety bill that I filed does have to do with additional DPU oversight over certain projects that would, you know, should we get it passed, would facilitate some of similar conversations about this. So the, the concern is, is recognized, and I, I agree that, you know, just from a safety perspective now that we're, we've seen you know what can happen when there isn't proper oversight and uh, isn't proper safety protocol that we you know hopefully we'll be able to have a serious conversation about that great thank you very much we really do need help from a higher power the real higher power <laughs> but then the lower higher power too <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Nasser, you have thank you. Comments, please. so um 
just to springboard off the Eversource piece, um, I think the deep, you know, the, the oversight, the DPU oversight is uh, certainly appreciated, but I think, um, I think community involvement and just getting, you know, getting the word from the people in the town, um, having community meetings, let us know what's going on and take suggestions. I think how can that, how can that be bad? That, that really would foster the, you know, the public p partnership between the towns and, and uh, the utilities. Um, so I thank you for everything that you do there. Um, we can certainly raise that with, with Eversource to do that more and to participate, be a more active community mm -hmm. member. Mm -hmm. I think that would be reassuring to the public at large, especially after what happened in the right. Merrimack Valley. Um, I would like to thank you both for all the work that you've been doing. Uh, I think the Veterans Affairs work is, is incredible, fuel assistance. I mean, it's this is really important stuff, and I think it's something that uh, we need people who have given to this country, you know, we need to give back. So I, I truly appreciate everything you do there. Um, I appreciate also the foresight that you have in looking at all projects with uh, climate change in mind. And that's that's one of the things that, you know, when, when we had our kids, that was one of the, that was my biggest fear, is like, what world will they live in with, with a warming planet? We just saw the polar vortex come through, we're seeing the California wildfires, and what's going to come next? <laughs> you know, it can, it can be scary. And I think, I think having a little bit of vision and looking at what, what's coming our way and what could come our way and how are we going to manage that is, uh, is critical. But um, we can't just accept that it's coming. I think we also need to take measures to, to oppose it. As a new uh, electric vehicle owner, um, I would love to see a lot more infrastructure for, for electric vehicles. Uh, it, it only makes sense, and uh, it's far more fun to drive. <laughs> right. We should have the infrastructure. We should have more incentives for... Uh, people to want to buy, and we should get more of the, the car companies. It's it's um, they, they need to be producing more as well, so that there are better choices among the choices, and that they can go further. But that's when you know the batteries and the storage is another area that I think Massachusetts. We we are the innovation economy. If any state can come up with good storage in batteries for. Uh, electric cars for saving the electricity produced by offshore wind and solar to store it for another time if we don't need to use it all. Massachusetts should be able to do that and that's one area that I'm hoping we, we grab the, uh, the innovation and the jobs with that as well. And I think we're well suited to. Um, I, I, I was amazed when I flew over uh, I flew to California and on the way back, I flew over Arizona, and flying over Massachusetts, you see solar panels everywhere. And over Arizona, I didn't see a single one. And it just makes me wonder, okay, well, <laughs> we're leading the way. Here we are up in the cold northeast, and we're still able to make the use of the sun. And uh, we have the incentives. And our solar guy's not here to really <laughs> talk about everything that you guys do for us. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but I think that's, that's it's critical, um, and I think we've been leading the way. Um, I don't understand why a state like Arizona wouldn't have <laughs> all, all solar. Um, are we all sitting here? We, this is a joint meeting with the school committee as well, and I do apologize for the seating arrangement with your backs, people with their backs to them, but we have also have five members of the school committee, plus the school superintendent, plus their business manager, Susan Rothermish. So um, I would certainly like school community get their chance to chime in um, have at it please uh, again I, we apologize for the seating arrangements not uh, to, uh, not to shut you up I could flip this around and make it sit here would point to chairs there but well maybe someone would, who would like to speak would like to at least come up and use Mr. Nazarul's microphone if you like two at a time there <laughs> So thank you both so much for coming. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you both in the district. And as Mr. Tenstone said before, we do see you quite, we're fortunate to see you quite a bit. Uh, I, 
I'm concerned about a lot of things in Hopkinton, and I love a lot of what you said that will impact us uh, positively. The foundation budget stuff is huge for us. I'm also concerned with unfunded mandates and how um, that impacts us in the growth. I know that both of you are aware of the growth that we've gone through as a town and how that's impacted our schools has been particularly difficult. Uh, the number of students we have coming in just daily, we've had it just since we passed our budget, we've had an additional 50 students come into the district. So that's, it's hard to project what we need right now for next year and it's difficult to be able to continue to meet the needs. And then on top of that, the space issues that we have. Uh, we had, it, was it last week that we were here with the uh, statement of interest uh, for the MSBA for the Elmwood School, which is our, uh, currently our 2-3 school. I know you were both at the opening for the marathon, it, it which is It came our, out beautiful. It's a beautiful school. It did, and it was a beautiful process with the MSBA, and we felt so fortunate to be able to get it done. But we now, as we've seen the growth go through that, we're, it's coming up through each of our schools, and we're going to need sig some significant investment into our schools to keep them able to meet the needs of the number of students we have. So that's just to put that on your radar, we are getting ready sub to submit, I think it's our third submission to the MSBA this year for the Elmwood School. I know it's probably a little tricky when we had one in process with the Marathon School, but now that Marathon is done, we are hoping to get called in um, for Elmwood before we're coming out all kinds of different themes. So that was one I also... So can I just oh, ask yes. you, I know that the 2018-2019 school year has exceeded enrollment projections by almost 200 yes. students, right? What, what, are, what is the major age group there? So is it, is it the elementary? Or it, so we see it at a couple of different entry points. We see it, people seem to want to come, and Dr. Kavanaugh has said this more eloquently, I don't want to steal her words, but steal. they come <laughs> in at different points in the district. The first point is we see, saw a, a big surge at the kindergarten for people who presumably want the full K to 12 experience. The next grouping we see is a jump in kids coming in in the sixth grade and then the eighth, ninth grade for kids who want to come or families who want their kids to be here for the, either the middle and, middle and high school years or just the high school years. So those groups seem to be hit the hardest, but of course the, those kindergartners are gonna trickle up and right. feel across the district. We, we find that our kids, once they come, it, our grades don't, we don't see big groups dropping off at any point. We had growth in across the district, but just more particularly in those grade points. Is anything good there? So, I don't, want, I don't want to jump in. No, go some. ahead, finish up. I, I do have one question, okay. but I'll wait. So, the mental health uh, is a huge th thing. I am a mental health clinician, so that is big for me in my professional life as well, but also from the school committee side. I very much appreciated being at your social-emotional learning. And that was, you know, I lost track of when that was, but that was a great event. And I, it means a lot to see that at the state level, to see that that is a, a focus for your office and for coming through the Senate. Right. This is our third year doing that and we'll continue. So again, any suggestions for, for the next, per, next, uh, next time would be great. It, it is though, I, I know from the school point, it's a challenge to try to find the programs that are gonna meet our kids' needs so that we're not just reacting to issues that pop up so that we're able to be a little bit more proactive rather than reactive uh, and just where we're able to build some of those programs and to grow some of that to protect our kids while we're at the same time battling growth and enrollment issues and trying to tackle other unfunded right. mandates in the state. Right. Well, you know, one, one thing that, that with the, the mental health initiative and um, as Senate Chair Ways and Means, I tried to put more funds in for programs and services to tackle the, the mental health issues and concerns both from kids early on at different programs to creating the family resource centers that now at least we have one in Framingham. I'm hoping it, it expands in Metro West for, and to, through adults, but also in schools, you know, we, we did put some funds in for um, expanding mental health counselors in some of the larger school districts and I'm hoping to have that trickle down 
to, to all schools. So again, if, I, if you have some specific ideas as to how to help, please forward them on to us. That would be great. I'm not sure I have solutions, but I, I will, am happy to forward thoughts okay, that I have great. just from thank you. the side. But thank you again, both of you, for being here and for all of the work that you do on behalf of our district and for the rest of the Commonwealth. Much appreciated. Yeah, I, I also feel the same way. I think everyone's been talking about this. I catch up a little bit of what all you do through social media, and it's amazing the amount of work that both of you do and all the places you seem to show up. Um, one thing, this is just me being one voice um, asking this question and actually first starting with thanking you both uh, for having supported the gifted education study in Massachusetts. It's something which is very close and dear to me. And um, you know, you have very openly talked about mental health and acceptance of that. And I worry about the social emotional needs of this group of students in, in the state and all over. It is not their choice that this label has been put on them. It's a very heavy label which a lot of people struggle with. Um, but, so I wonder what is it that we could do in terms of first recognizing that these kids exist and their particular social emotional needs and how is it that we can do something uh, to recognize and address their needs. Yeah, I know there are some bills that were filed this year to um, address them. They, again, the, the session's just getting started, but uh, if you want, we could forward you the bill numbers and, and summaries of, of the bills so that you could at least follow that. Um, and I know that, that there's discussion about putting some um, funding for grant programs in the budget as well to address some of these issues. And I, I think the commission that was established, right, that you were referencing, um, that it was established, I think, in last year's budget, that the role of a commission generally is to get experts around the table to come up with just the kind of recommendations that you're talking about, you know, to identify where students have needs, where the state can intervene with supportive services. So the hope would be out of that commission would come a series of recommendations that would then come back to both the House and the Senate to, to allow us to then, you know, file legislation or put in place actionable um, steps forward to address just the kind of needs you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. It's not easy. We have so many things to deal with. And this is one of those things um, that I feel should come out in the open to however difficult the conversation is. Thank you. Thank you for raising it. I don't know if any of the others wanted to come up. Do you want to be heard? You can go here. Can you come to the big chair? Yeah. Just can't talk about solo on that. Um, to piggyback off one of the things that Nancy mentioned, I think the unfunded mandates in education is, is just a problem across the board, and it's one of the things that I know it's constantly a work in progress. But in particular, based on the growth that we've seen in the community over the last couple of years, the last 30 days, um, lots of these children are coming in with special education needs as well. And so I think if we can continue to sort of hammer away at, you know, if the state is going to require, and for sure the needs of the children dictate that we need to provide these services, the cost of these services, special education is an enormous, enormous part of our school budget. And I think that we need to um, make sure that the laws say we need to require these services, but I mean, we need to require these services as sort of a moral obligation to the, to the needs of these children. And it's an enormous cost to the community. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that many of the children that have come into the community, even in the last school year calendar, come in with special needs. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely one of the things that we've focused on in building our budget but we would love some help. Right. Well, that, that's part of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. Uh, it would increase the assumed percentage of, of special ed students in, in school, so school districts would get a bump out of that, um, and it would, uh, in, the, in, the, in the budget, it, it addresses both in-district and out-of-district. So right now, the circuit breaker does more of the out-of-district costs, but. Again, we, we, and I will 
try, and I think the House has a, it as a priority too, to fully fund the special ed circuit breaker, but the Foundation Budget Review Commission's changes would be in addition to the special money that cities and towns get from the special education circuit breaker, so that that would increase the funding that Hopkinton would get for that. Which would be great, and, and along with that too, the transportation piece, which is the other giant chunk of our of our budget, um, which is increasing as a result of increased enrollment, but also because with children who require special education transportation, that adds to. So I mean, all of these things. It's you know growth, unfunded mandates, transportation. You, you mentioned them all in, in in your presentation, but it's just you know the communities are feeling that, and so just to make sure that we keep working to to do what we can to soften the blow. Thank you. I'll leave the seat now. Right. <laughs> Comment. Mr. Kamala, please. Um, through the chair, allow me to add to uh, the sentiments of gratitude that have been expressed by board members. Uh, specifically, I want to take this opportunity to thank your professional teams who we work with regularly, uh, whether it's calling Dave or is calling members of your team. Uh, they're always very responsive, they're professional, and they have assisted us in, in many cases. I do have a question, though, regarding local aid. Uh, granted, the, you've heard so much regarding the growth in this community. Uh, the budget that was proposed by the governor was less than fair uh, to Hopkinton. I think our local aid only went up by 18,000, in spite of the growth that has been... Um, I talked about tonight. So I'm wondering, are we going to have a local aid resolution soon? And I asked that question because I also heard that the budget process may be finishing in June. That's pretty much late for towns. So I'm wondering whether we're going back to, you know, three years ago where there was a local aid resolution that will state clearly the levels of local aid so that towns can proceed with their budget processes. Right, right. Um, I can tell you, I mean, June is when we usually let the cities and towns know. Um, what we usually say, though, is you could at least bank on the governor's numbers, and then the, I know the House tries to do more, and if we can, the Senate tries to do more. There's pluses and minuses to having a local aid resolution. If there's an agreement between the House and the Senate, and we say in March or, you know, whatever, at the beginning of April, this is how much you're, you're getting, and then the numbers get even better, it's harder to add to that after there's an agreement. Mm -hmm. But in recognition of the fact that it, we know it does help cities and towns, um, we've raised that with the House to, and started discussions. We haven't done that in a number of years because the finances, if you remember, the last few years have been so iffy. Um, they've been really bad, actually, except for this year, uh, where we had to cut, you know, a hundred, uh, almost a billion dollars two years ago. So um, we'll see. Uh, we, you know, we recognize that this is something that does help um, generally in a lot of ways, and if we can do it, we will. Thank you. I just want to say, in, in wrapping up, too, um, we've all been talking about the amount of growth in this town, particularly as it relates to the school population. And, you know, we know the impact on direct education costs, but also there are just so many ancillary uh, effects uh, for all town services and for infrastructure. Uh, we're looking, you know, that bubble of students that right now is being accommodated by the Marathon School, and we are most concerned because our request to get into the MSBA school process for Elmwood has been refused twice, but now that bubble of students, they, they keep growing. You know, they're in first grade now. They're going to be in second or third very soon. So this is creating some real anxiety on the part of the town to literally where are you going to put these students if we can't start to get these building situations taken care of. And of course, all of our town services increased uh, needs for parks and rec, increased needs for family services, the, the whole, the whole panoply of services. Um, I would also mention you're probably aware, um, Carolyn certainly, because she's most familiar with the, with the details of the town. Of course, we decommissioned our center school last fall, well, in June, after Marathon came online. But so now we have this building, which there's a, there are a lot of town 
departmental needs as well as one really important need to meet is the life skills program for the 18 to 22 year olds which has been taking up some classroom space in one of our other schools which we could stand to free up and also we could stand to expand that program if we could use the center school as well as a whole all the other town services that grow out of town growth um, but that of course you know that's probably a 12 or 15 mil million dollar project to recondition that school so that's another another pressure on our town budgets that come out of out of town growth and so I just wanted to mention the variety of pressures that I know all towns experience these when they experience growth but as you know Hopkinton has really been a standout in the state of Massachusetts for exponential growth right now so you know I just I just want you to be aware of where some of the other concerns lie that if there's any way that assistance can be brought in one way or another to relieve some of those pressures uh, it would it, it's really uh, an important an important thing for us so um, but okay. what you've done and uh, we're just so glad that you're, we have you on our team and that you've taken this time and that the communication lines are always, are always so open with both your offices. And um, I think we should probably wrap it up because you have given more than enough time. I think you were scheduled for 45 minutes and you've given us more than an hour and I know you're awful busy. So well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Have a great night. We will. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening and welcome to the continuation of our Tuesday, March 5th meeting. We, as people who were down there know, we started downstairs with a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen and we are gonna continue in here with the rest of our regular business for this meeting. So I would ask, we're gonna call the meeting to order and those who are in attendance who would like to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we will stand and there's a flag back and locate it back there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, we have uh, not too, too long of an agenda, but we will try to move through it so we don't keep people here past a reasonable amount of time. But um, we will start with reports with the superintendent's report. I just have a couple of very brief remarks. Um, I would like to remind parents and community members that on Saturday we have our focus groups and we will be in the Hopkinton High School Library from 9 to 1.30. It is not too late to sign up to be part of the community conversation. So. If you are interested in that, please do. And the second thing is that we did send out the page two of the calendar last night, and we've gotten a few responses today. So that's all we have. That's great. So now I'm um, going to move into the school committee chair report, and I have approved for payroll the warrant S19018. The payroll warrant has been included in your packet. Uh, as people know, our school committee office hours uh, had to be rescheduled due to a scheduling issue uh, with Legacy Farms, and I know that, Nina, you are working on that, and you'll get back to us when we have a confirmed date, or do you have... Uh, so we did say Saturday, uh, March 9th, from 4 to 6 p.m. One thing that did come up is I was speaking with um, someone who's a resident of, okay. uh, of Legacy Farms and that parent was saying that uh, she's not aware of this um, so she requested if it could be sent to the owners association and if you could if I have your permission I can just grab something that this is the time frame and we're meeting they had a mechanism through which to reach out to the entire community to That's be great. able to join that would be great and we have a confirmed location as well to not yet okay so and I, I was just wondering if not the night if there's a better date i know amanda and meg and even jen expressed that you can't make the night i don't know if the following week is a better week for i can make a four to six <coughs> okay okay so, and we can do it again okay. sure yes uh, we can do it week. the first yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a good one location that sounds good and then uh, when we have that location, if we can put that up on the 
sure. website, that would be great. I'm assuming it, it, it would be open to people outside of legacy farms as well. Absolutely. That's great, thank you. The only other thing I was gonna add is that we had our budget advisory uh, committee meeting, uh, was that yesterday? Yesterday. It feels like it's been a long week already. Uh, so we, we had a good meeting, a productive meeting with uh, the, the town manager and directors of finance, uh, both Mrs. Rodemuth, excuse me, Mrs. Rodemuth, and uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and I and uh, Mr. Manning, the appropriations chair. Uh, the board of selectmen chair was not able to be at it, but we got some feedback from the board of selectmen that they are looking to shift things around in the budget a little bit more to bring down the, I had it, the exact, numbers I had here, but trying to move the excess levy, some of the excess levy that is being used to use less of it. So they're looking at shifting how things are funded a little bit. So they are going to be working on some different things with our budget as well. So that's more information to come uh, when we meet in our next meetings. So that's really all I have for that. And that will allow us to move into uh, our next item of business, which is the High School Program of Studies. Uh, and I will invite uh, Mr. Bishop to come forward. <laughs> He's trying to get you to go to high school and snap to attention. Yeah. <laughs> I think Alan is pushing my attention. Well, thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. This is nice and clean. I like it. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about our program of studies for next school year. We have a few new courses that I thought I would talk a little bit about, uh, and also talk just about the course selection timeline process, just so we have an, an understanding of how it works. So I thought I'd start with that, the course selection timeline. So last week we had class meetings for our 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Our guidance department met with each class, talked about the different courses, talked about how to sign up through Power School, answered any questions that they had about the whole process. Um, and then this week, our staff is meeting with each of the kids to talk about what courses they should take next year, what levels they should take as well. So then the staff is also taking this week to implement their recommendations into Power School. They have until the end of the school day on Friday. So they're having conversations this week with students and then inputting their recommendations. And then the students get to go in at 4 o'clock on Friday for a week to put in their course recommendations. So um, that is the timeline in terms of when to input their courses. Then the eighth grade starts about two weeks after that. We have our eighth grade parent night on Thursday, March 28th, where we talk about all the great things about the high school and get the parents excited about sending their child to the high school. Uh, we talk about the course selection process. They meet with all the different SMLs. It's a wonderful night. Then the next day, the eighth grade comes over for an assembly. They meet with some upperclassmen. They also meet with our guidance staff to talk about the course selection process. So then they will also have a week to implement their courses as well. So that takes us to about mid-April. And from about mid-April through the end of the school year, really, um, we'll be building the master schedule. That's when we decide what courses are going to run, how many sections that we need. Uh, SMLs meet with students that want an override. Um, our guidance department meets with students if there's any conflicts. And Linda Henderson, who is our data manager, who's wonderful, will start to run the master schedule. We always try to get it done before the end of the school year. Uh, oftentimes it doesn't happen, it carries over in the summer. Uh, we work on it then, and then we provide the students with their schedule as orientation day and picture day in August. So that's really the timeline, the process. So in terms of the new courses, we're excited to uh, be bringing on five new courses. Uh, the first is, well, actually, let me start by saying there's no additional funding needed for any of these courses. So <laughs> I'm sure you were wondering about that. Um, we're all, we only run courses based on student interests. So if these courses have interest, then there'll be other courses that probably won't run. Uh, in your memo, I provided courses that did not run this year just to give you a sense of some of the courses that didn't run. But my guess is next year, some of those courses will probably run just based on what students are interested in. And a lot of these courses that I'm going to talk about tonight, the five new ones, came about from students and their interest in wanting to take some of these courses. So I know you have the descriptions. I won't go too deep into them. Uh, the first is an intro to computer science course. So we currently have um, three courses, web page design, mobile app development, and we call CS Discoveries, Computer Science Discoveries, that we offer now. And we've seen some low enrollment in those three courses. So we thought we'd kind of step back a little bit, take those three classes, and put them into an introductory to computer science course. Ha talk about those different courses, but also talk about hardware, and networking, and data representation, and manipulation as well. Kind of just have a general sense in a semester course uh, for computer science. And it's open to all grades. 
9 through 12. So we're hoping some freshmen will be interested in this course. So that's going to be a little bit of a different. We're not going to have as many offerings in the business tech and engineering department, but we're going to be kind of more strategic and focused on the computer science path. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a minute. Um, the second course is in our visual arts department. It's called User Experience Design, or UX. You may be familiar with this. It's basically a course that is geared to merging multiple disciplines, such as uh, visual design, architecture, engineering, and a few other different kind of disciplines, all with the idea of focusing on product development and the user experience in mind. So students will be pushed to think creatively, work collaboratively, strategize in groups, coming up with different projects, presentations when they're thinking about the user in mind, using all these different components of, of art. It's going to be taught by Colleen Janino, our SML for Visual Arts, one that you know very well, and she's very excited about this course, so uh, we expect there to be a, a quite a bit of interest in this course for next year. And again, it's a semester course, open to all grades. Uh, next is Human Geography, uh, which is in our History Social Science Department, and it'll be a course that will introduce students to the systemic study of patterns that have shaped the human understanding, use, and alterations of the Earth's surface. Uh, it's following the National Geogra uh, Geography Standards that were developed back in 2012. Uh, it's a course open to students grades 12 through, uh, 10 through 12, excuse me, it's a semester course, but there is potential if there's interest to offer it at an AP level in the future, but that's something we want to consider. And that's going to be taught by Brian Prescott, one of our uh, rock star young history teachers in high school. Uh, and then the next two classes are actually taking a, you know, we, we used to offer conceptual physics uh, for some of our seniors. We have struggled to get that class going. Like this year we actually didn't run it. The two years before we had very low enrollment in that course. So we thought we would kind of step back, similar to what we did with the computer science, and take the course and split it into two semester courses to see if we could generate a little bit more interest. So as you can see in your description, one is going to focus more on mechanics, uh, specifically understanding physics as it pertains to the laws of motion. Um, you know, how do you shoot a perfect three throw? Could you play your uh, favorite sport on the moon? Some of those questions using some uh, mathematical equations to guide your thinking. Uh, and then the other semester will be electromagnetism, uh, focusing on that uh, with electricity and waves and investigating how wind or moving water generate electricity. A lot of the stuff that they learned freshman year in physics, but building on a little bit. And we think having semesters as opposed to locking them in for the year might get some of the numbers up in those courses because they'll be able to maybe take a semester of the mechanics, but also take forensics or take blue plan and have some flexibility. So we'll see how that goes, uh, but we're excited to kind of put a little bit more uh, uh, energy into the physics program for senior year, because we have seen some numbers come down a little bit. So we'll see how that, that works. Then there are two courses I just wanted to mention that I guess we're, we're, we're restoring to the program of studies. Um, we've had them in there before, but have not run these courses for the last at least two years, maybe three years. The first is AP Computer Science A. Now that is looked at as probably the more challenging AP Computer Science course. So uh, you may know or may remember I came a few years ago and we talked about not offering this course because the students that took this course really struggled at the high school. So we decided to offer the AP Computer Science Principles course, which in a lot of ways is a feeder course into the AP Computer Science A course. Um, it's a lot more accessible to students. We wanted to kind of build the foundation of knowledge when it came to this, this subject matter, since we were seeing students struggle in the Computer Science A course. So we have run the Computer Science Principles course the last two years. We've seen success, and now we have a cohort of students that are interested in kind of taking it to the next level. So that's why we wanted to bring this class back into the program of study. So we're expecting one, maybe two sections, because right now we have two sections of AP Computer Science Principles. So if all of those kids take it, we'll see two sections, but I'm assuming at least one section will run next year. And then the other course that we're restoring um, is Honors Art History. We have an AP Art History course at the high school. It's a very popular course, but we've been getting some feedback from some students that are interested in the subject matter, but are a little bit hesitant to take it at the AP level. So we thought we would offer it at an honors level, so we're not tied to the AP curriculum. We can slow down a little bit, focus more in depth in some of the different topics. So um, we put this in the program before, haven't had enough interest to run it, but we are hearing from students this year that they're very interested in this. So we are bringing that back into the program. So that's really kind of a very quick um, uh, summary of the timeline and process and some of the new courses that we're, we're adding. Uh, and like I said, I have put on the memo some of the courses that we did not offer this year, just to give you a sense of some of the courses that didn't run based on student interest. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the program, the classes, the process, anything you'd like to talk about. So just for clarity, the yep. ones that were not, the ones that are listed here, the music theory, acoustic guitar, that, mm -hmm. that list, 
will be thrown out as a possibility for students? Yes, okay. that'll, that, that those good. classes will once again be in the program of studies. Um, they just didn't have enough student interest this past school year to run a section. I love how you are able to respond to student interest and in, to shift things around based on that from one year to the next and to open up new courses based on what looks like up and coming yeah. and then to hold courses back that maybe haven't been as popular. And all these courses could be taught at university. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the specificity of focus is fantastic, yeah. the level of creative engagement for the students. I love it. Yeah, it's I agree. really so, great. Yep, yep. We have a lot of passionate teachers that are, yeah. are oftentimes behind creating these courses and are very it's interested amazing. and invested in the subject matter. So I mean, exciting. when I was in high school, I studied <laughs> American history, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Yep. Algebra, yep. English. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. this is very impressive. Thank you. I was just going to say, and, and to touch on what you just said, the passion behind the scenes, and I, we get to see Colleen periodically Absolutely. at the yeah. school committee, and love seeing her passion, and love that she's able to bring it forward in another yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky students. Lucky. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I say this so many times over the year. Uh, I would love to be a student at the same yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the one thing I thought uh, which caught my eye was the comparative mythology. Mm -hmm. well, how fantastic is that? It is that's, a great that's a course in yeah. high school. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that, I would yeah. totally enroll in that. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great course. I'm taught by Mr. Franchot, who's a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yep. Thank you for all that you do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I will be Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm lucky <laughs> to get to observe the classes. Okay, so it's great. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about the computer, a couple of questions yeah. about the computer science sure. offerings. I love the half semester intro to ComSci. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of people who talk about their kids um, developing a, a perspective that STEM and ComSci are just for A students mm -hmm. and accelerating people. It's not for me, it's not my thing, and, which is still not true. Yeah. I mean, right. between the human interface design, mm -hmm. which is in graphics, but it's also very huge in, in STEM mm -hmm. um, and the computer class. I love it. I love that we're trying to make it more accessible. Um, I would love to you know, disabuse people of this notion that mm -hmm. you, it's only for certain people. Sure. So sure. Uh, hats off for all that. Um, I would love, and I know I've said this to you before privately, and yeah. I know this is like nearly impossible scheduling wise, but I still would love to just reiterate that I think every student who graduates from the high school should have a half semester foundation in the technology world that we're growing up in. It's the same kind of a science as biology, chemistry, physics, and the technology world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just equally part of our environment. I know it's, you know, it doesn't fit. <laughs> it's impossible to make that happen. I love that we're offering this. Mm -hmm. I'd love it if it could be mandatory so that sure. like everybody could take it. Yeah. So, yeah. I just keep saying that. Yeah, no, no. I, I, <laughs> Someday yeah, when we have and I would, I'd say it's not impossible. Um, you know, there's obviously some roadblocks with staff and things like that, but yeah. I don't disagree with you in terms of having more students access this course. It's just, so, it's so great. And so, mm -hmm. unfortunately, so few, so many, you know, we have 100 however many kids in band, mm -hmm. so none of them will get many electives. So it's, you know, it's tough, but it's tough. you know, it's, mm -hmm. you're doing a great job. I love it. I, yeah. My question about AP, mm -hmm. yep. um, comp side, yep. A and principals. Mm -hmm. Does it, do we have to have that prerequisite for AP Comsci A? I know we ran it before. Yep. We struggled to score well mm -hmm. on the exam. Yep. We had a lot of kids who were doing lots of wonderful things under Mr. Uh, Mr. Scott's mm -hmm. tutelage sure. and just growing up doing technology. And I know that like AP Comsci like A is Java based, mm -hmm. and yep. the other course principles is much more accessible for a broader range it of is. students. It's different in a lot of ways too. Yeah, and I know like College Board doesn't actually say one is a prerequisite for the other. Correct. That's um, really what was our decision. I think it, it stemmed from kind of going back and looking how the students did in prior years, yeah. seeing their struggles, wanting to set them up for success, yeah. and kind of building this pathway of hopefully taking intro, but taking that kind of more accessible AP before jumping in. Because the coding is really heavy. If you don't have experience in that, it can get you, you can get overwhelmed pretty quickly. Yeah. We'll see how maybe this runs the first year, and yeah. maybe you know obviously there are exceptions if the kids, um, you know, we have an override process. You can meet with the SNLs if you really want to get into that class and kind of skip a prerequisite. We don't encourage that at all. No, I know. Um, but you know we're hesitant to just offer that without making sure 
that the students kind of, what we feel, take the right pathway to be able to be as successful as possible. And so I'm sure there's arguments both ways in terms of students should be able to do that, but I think what we've seen in the past, we don't want to repeat that. And we want to make yeah. sure that we kind of go through the right process in order for students to access that class. And maybe after a year we say, okay, maybe the, our kids can handle it, because now we've seen some of these kids in our intro to computer science class. Yeah. You know, so we can revisit that. But we think in the first year we wanted to kind of make sure we took the group of students that were successful in the, pr in the principles and that are showing interest yeah. to take that class on to see how it goes. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I guess I just worry that um, for, you know, for many kids, again, a lot of these band kids, they get their first elective as a senior. Mm -hmm. They have one year. Yeah. If they had demonstrated proficiency, if there was some other mechanism through which they could demonstrate readiness, because sure. um, taking up four semesters to get through that comps, yeah, it's, it, it's yeah. a lot yeah. in a schedule. Yeah, so yeah. Just, just throwing it out there yeah, as we see how we yeah. progress. Yeah. I think you bring up a really good point about trying to look for ways to be a little bit more creative or have some more flexibility in the younger years. Because as you know, yeah. freshman and sophomore year, if you do take band, you are very limited in what does, and then it opens up junior and senior year. Somewhat. Somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's something else we can kind of take a look at to see if it's any other flexibility with the schedule. And I just have one more mm -hmm. thing. Um, because it was so fun to read cover to cover the program of studies. Yeah, I mean, it yes. was really so, or so something Glad you I was enjoyed it. Yeah. so proud of. Yeah. I mean, I love so. cover to cover. I loved yeah. it. Um, I, I just want to clarify my understanding of the seal of biliteracy. Yes. I wasn't sure how I read the way I read it. it, it I, I took away from the print that it was primarily for students who go through French and Spanish mm -hmm. in our system mm -hmm. and demonstrate proficiency on the test. My other understanding was that we were going to open that up to mm -hmm. people who might be bilingual from mm -hmm. other background. Yes, is that true? That is true. Okay. Yep, that's actually, uh, sure. from my understanding, a letter that's going to be going out shortly uh, that's great. to the community about that. But that's great. Uh, I actually met with Marilyn, Mil uh, Marilyn Miracle, our SML for World Languages, just about this topic as other schools are looking to bring this on, so they're coming to us to kind of find out how we went through our process. Okay. Um, but she listed this all different types of languages that if a student is proficient in, we'll work with them to get the seal of better. So it's not that's just wonderful. for French and Spanish. If there are no uh, other questions for Mr. Bishop, I would seek a motion to approve the amendments to the high school program studies. I move to amend these. Second. Motion by Meg and a second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. So it is unanimous. Thank you very much for coming out and bearing with us through all of the stuff you've Yeah. Interesting to see. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Right. And that brings Mr. Keller in for the uh, middle school program studies. We don't want to do that. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, like Mr. Bishop, um, the middle school uh, has uh, revised uh, its program of studies for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, we don't have any major changes, however, I did highlight on my memo uh, a couple of the um, more significant pieces. Uh, the first two are related to curriculum frameworks, uh, so um, science, uh, the science, Massachusetts in 2016 came out with science, technology, engineering curriculum frameworks. Uh, framework, I should say, and so we changed grade six and seven this past year, and uh, we're updating grade eight for next year. That's a significant change that you'll see uh, in that regard. Uh, you may be aware also that the social studies curriculum uh, was changed um, in 2018. In the summer, it was the draft was finalized from the Massachusetts History and Social Science Curriculum Framework. And so uh, our social studies teachers have uh, spent much time uh, this school year working on revamping uh, their curriculum and so uh, there are changes to what students will experience next year as well as the year after um, and uh, I'll just tell you briefly uh, in, the, in the social studies piece next year uh, students in grade six will uh, have a course called world geography and ancient civilizations one uh, students in grade six this year had a course called ancient civilizations um, and then in grade seven next year, students will be taking a course called World Geography um, because, um, uh, yeah, so they'll be taking a World Geography course and then grade eight next year, students will be taking a course uh, called United States and Massachusetts Government and Civic Life. Uh, so we have a one year transition because those sixth graders took ancient civilizations uh, and, then, and then the following year, uh, our course um, sequence will be clearly identified and outlined and so that 
uh, in grade six, students will take World Geography and Ancient Civilizations one, and then the seventh grade course will be World Geography and Ancient Civilizations two. We just have that uh, one year transition period. Eighth grade will always be from this well, I should say always, but from this point forward until there's a curriculum framework change, will be United States and Massachusetts government and civic life, which we're actually quite excited about. Um, so those are the two major pieces related to uh, curriculum framework changes. Um, the bottom two items that I mentioned on the memo were related are, are simply name changes uh, related to math. We had a lot of confusion regarding the term honors, and so we ultimately felt as though it made the most sense to uh, remove that label from honors math seven and honors math eight and call it math seven and math eight. So, um, so just for clarification purposes, the course currently named honors math seven and honors math eight next year will be called math seven and math eight and the course currently named math seven and math eight will be renamed cotot math seven and cotot math eight um, and then finally the other major change um, related to our program of studies is next year in grade six we're going to begin offering a double block of uh, english language arts each day to our students um, and so um, that will um, that will take place uh, next year and that's for all students? That is for all students, that's correct, yes. But only six grade. Pardon? In, oh, sorry, grade. yes, correct, in grade six. Yes. 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 So those are the major changes. Was there some reasoning behind doubling the language arts for sixth graders? Yeah, so um, we uh, spent a lot of time um, this past year. So uh, in 2017, speaking of curriculum frameworks, uh, we, we received English language arts uh, or I think that was 2016, no, that was 2017, uh, new ELA and literacy frameworks. And, um, and so we spent a lot of time looking at how our students are performing um, on MCAS, on STAR reading, uh, uh, observations from teachers. The, the rigor of those frameworks um, are understandably, have understandably increased. Um, the, the task that our students are being asked to do has increased dramatically, and, and there's there was uh, there's always been this kind of um, belief or statement of uh, students um, start to learn to read, uh, and then around middle school they begin to um, uh, read to learn, and so uh, what we're finding, what the experts are saying, is that we're we're continuously learning to read uh, as the text complexity complexity increases. And so as students come from elementary, we're, we're, we're feeling as though we have, there's a lot more that we need to do with students. And you know, they come from elementary school with a 90 minute block in ELA and come to the middle school and, and, uh, and they have a 55 minute block essentially for, for ELA. And uh, so, we, so we spent a lot of time you know, uh, with Dr. Kavanaugh, um, with Ms. Parson, with our special education team chair, with Dr. Zaleski looking at how our students are doing on a lot of measures and then throughout the year meeting with teachers. So we met with, uh, as you may be familiar with, we have pro professional learning communities. We have opportunities to sit down with teachers and, and talk about what they're seeing and, and how um, we feel like they're doing and, and ultimately we feel like there would be tremendous benefit to, uh, at the grade six level, giving students more time. And, and we've, we've essentially identified um, some of the key areas that we feel like we need to, to focus on. And, you know, certainly in terms of reading, I mentioned text complexity increasing reading the content areas, um, where now um, students go from a, an English teacher to a, ma a math teacher to a science teacher to a social studies teacher, and those texts in those classes are, are difficult, and they're not, and those students don't get a lot of support uh, with how to read those non-fictional texts, and, and those non-fiction texts, and so that's um, one of the things that we're looking to accomplish with this class, is having this literacy block support those content areas. Um, and then also in terms of um, writing, um, the type of writing that students are being asked to do in terms of uh, expressing an argument um, and being able to um, provide uh, detailed support to some of that argument, uh, a lot of times there's just not enough time in the day and so we feel pretty strongly that um, we can be doing a lot more that could not just be benefiting their performance in, in English class, but uh, to improve the, the, whole, the whole student. And the last thing I did mention was research, is that's one of those things that has kind of been um, essentially pushed to the side that our teachers saying there's just not enough time to get to, is how to conduct research. So those are, the, those are really the, the, the three pieces. I'm excited to see the consequence of this doubling. I think it will be tremendous because as you say, I'm still learning to read. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure out how sentences work. So Absolutely. good for those young, nimble minds <laughs> yeah. that have a double block every day yeah. on it. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to see it as well.
Um, was there something that we had to trim back on to create the space for that? Um, so, um, well, so we have had, ever since I've been principal and long before, as, as I understand it, uh, we have had, the sixth grade has had a uh, schedule uh, because they've only had, the students have only had four academics and seventh and eighth grade have had a different schedule. Um, so, it, because there's five content areas in grade seven and eight, and so the class periods in grade six were longer, and so the, so it's it's been, like we've managed, and I think that um, kids, adults have managed, but to have the school on the same schedule, which is which what we'll be able to do next year, and have the periods equal length, uh, will be a benefit. But ultimately, uh, what's being sacrificed is, uh, you know the the typical period in seventh and eighth grade is 55 not typical the, the period in seventh and eighth grade is 55 minutes whereas most periods in grade six were um, 90 minutes and so so other classes will be condensed in order to um, to have everybody on a essentially 55 minute period okay. there are no other questions uh, then I would seek a motion to approve the uh, middle school uh, the amendments to the middle school program of studies. I move to approve the amendments to the middle school program of studies. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Mina. And all those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. And it is unanimous. Uh, and so thank you very much for coming. Course, and I appreciate you taking you. time. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Thank you. So that brings us back to the old business uh, we heard last week from Nina had presented and Amanda also uh, on the inclusion training uh, with the Youth Commission, who we, I'm, I'm looking over there because we do have uh, members of the Youth Commission here, uh, but the visions training, and we had wanted to bring this back uh, because people wanted to some time to absorb it, and I was able to get a little bit of information back. We had talked a little bit about the administration uh, being difficult to choose a few administrators to do that so that if the administration was going to do it, a desire to have a separate um, additional training for the central admin team. And I was able to speak with them and, and to pass on some information for that would be to be a separate training. So that I guess what we want to look at here tonight is if people had further questions. Uh, I, I guess if it's all right, uh, Dawn, if you or Stacia would be willing if people had any questions in mm -hmm. addition to what we already heard from Amanda and Mina so that we could make a decision on the visions training um, for that piece primarily to, in fairness to them. Uh, and then to discuss kind of where we want to go uh, moving forward. So that's, anybody have thoughts they want to bring back, questions from the last meeting regarding? So can you just clarify what the offering is? It's for us to do the training alongside Youth Commission folks? Yes. And this yes. this would be scheduled for this summer, ish maybe. Do you want to come up? Do you want to come up and sit yeah. up here? With come, the on up, Doug. <laughs> come on up, Come on up. my mom's like, clothes. Not prepared so, for this, but uh, <laughs> we just it, it might right. just be helpful so that people if people at home would like to hear more. So, um, as far as my team with the youth commission, we'll be sending four people. Um, and we were flexible with, you know, at our meeting, there was some talk about some community members, um, maybe other people in the school that work directly with children. So we were also flexible with that. Um, it was 18, I think, right. in, in this training that yep. we could we could hit. So I said, you know, okay, we can, we can go down to four from our youth commission side, and then it would be however you guys decided who to send, um, or all of you, some of you. Um, and we really were even flexible with who else wanted to join in. Um, we wanted to more keep it to administration or town leaders opposed to other volunteer organizations um, to start with. I did want to clarify though, in this training, there would not be youth. So ideally, we want to be secure enough in the training to be able to lay the foundation and eventually, yes, have some of us confident enough that we would share this with our youth liaisons and it would grow. As our town grows, as we take on more trainings, this foundation would grow. Um, but there, there will not be youth at this training. We felt it was uh, intense. We all are gonna be experiencing it for the first time. 
um, not the place for the youth to jump in at this point. So a lot of flexibility with scheduling, I, depending on who's going, I, I even kind of left that up to Nancy and said I understand there's teacher schedules and different administrators schedules so we're fine with doing it during the summer. Um, just on the Youth Commission end we felt we really needed to start a foundation of collaboration so we wanted to get something locked down but we're not set on it has to be now, here, this, that can all be worked out. <coughs> Did I miss anything? No, man. This is this is helpful, and uh, you know, Dean, thank you for bringing this up. You know, all the work that you've, all the legwork that you guys have already done. Um, you're talking about opening it up to the community, you know, because we have 18 spots, right? And you're talking about four. I don't know, given our schedules and whatnot, and, uh, you know, just in all fairness, I'm thinking maybe three or four from our end is what it might turn out to be. Although it, we would like it to be five. Let's say it's even five. We still have nine other spots remaining, and I'm just wondering, Dr. Um, Cameron, there is a Google Groups that was formed, I believe, based on uh, people who signed up at the various forums that we had. I, I don't know if that's the conversation. Oh, sure. If that's something we want to open up to see, if there are community members uh, who have shown interest in this topic would we be interested in having some folks like that join? Should we, you know, we talked about opening it up to Connor and perhaps Heather Batman, all of that, right? Um, so Arts and Rec. Arts and Rec is something Meg yeah. had mentioned. So I was just wondering, you know, given that we have nine other spots, how could we, you know, get that combination so that we have more people getting that awareness and that training? And you know, this is a long road. It'll take a long time. This is a great start. So how can we get the first round of people? Um, I think Rick, when we were discussing the 18, you know, he had res really responded to the both of us saying, the key here is to get the people that are really passionate about this right now and, and are comfortable doing this and laying that foundation. So on, on our end, we feel secure with the Youth Commission that we have those four key players that had actually started this process of looking in and researching even last year. Um, so, like I said, we are open to, I mean, if one of the SRO officers, we had thought that they're, they're in our buildings. I think we have a new one at Hopkins now and the middle school. Um, but again, being sensitive to, uh, I don't know whether that's a commitment for them on their on time or on their off time. So. Those are all conversations in areas that we are really willing to be very flexible with. Um, it's more just, okay, we, we've got to move forward. We're going to move forward with X amount of people and we can sort of figure out between now and the training who the other people might be. But I don't think we have a real strong opinion on who else is coming to the coming in. So we don't have to make that decision tonight. That's this is right, just right, about right. we're going to donate some money to the cause. I would think if, if we were going to do it, it would be more the investment, of, to the investment of allowing us to then be included, those of us, yes. however many of us wanted to be included to, I, I know the Youth Commission has put right. up the bulk of the money already, um, but if this is, we had talked back in October maybe about wanting to get some training for yeah. ourselves this is one way opportunity it's an opportunity also to collaborate with the Youth Commission which I think is a powerful visual for the town to see us working we work you know hand in hand on so many different things uh, and I think a good opportunity less expensive than it would be for us to do our own training for sure but Nancy, I just want to throw in, I know you talked about some additional training goals, and we had talked about Jamil, who uh, Dr. Kavanaugh had recommended as a possibility, which would be some free training also. I, I don't think it would stop with this, so those may be some other okay. considerations. And, you know, off of uh, uh, some conversation that we had had, um, uh, a member of the community who serves on the personnel committee, uh, apparently they had done some training for the town uh, pro bono so th that's also yes. another possibility 
um, to look at. In, in, just so to understand what you're saying, you're talking about we could do multiple things. That's right. And so I, some I additional training. Yeah. Um, I think I can take her name. Her name is Patricia yes. Duarte. And she had done some training uh, for the town employee. She serves on the personnel committee. So maybe that's some, another thing to explore um, why you're waiting you know, to get some of this bigger training sorted. Now maybe a one day, half a day perhaps. I don't know. I'm just making this up. And I don't know how long to know. Nancy, what did you say at the outset about the administrative team? So the administrative team attention? would have their own okay. segment of this that they would, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh could work directly to with Rick if that is the option that you guys end up mm -hmm. going with because it would be a separate cost okay. different from this just because the team, it, he also, because I did actually phone him between our last meeting and now just to hear his take on it, it just based on an 18 person administrative team, the cost is a little bit different because he would want an additional senior level person, uh, senior level trainer in the actual meeting that he did not feel would be necessary for the elected leader kind of role. So that was his take on it. And that made sense to me as well. Yeah. And, and if in this training you have space for me, I'd be happy to come in and just sort of see what it's like for my team. You yeah. know? Yeah. So yeah. that might be a nice way to like, oh, get my toe in the pool. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it would give yeah. you then, if if that's the avenue you decide to pursue sure. for your own yeah. professional development team, mm -hmm. that would give you kind of the framework to say, well, yes. we'd like this piece, but not that piece, or you know, whatever right. it is. Right. Yeah. That, that would that be perfect. Yeah. 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 Because then you would also know what we are talking about when we talk about these guidelines and whatever. Yeah. This is perfect. Yeah, if you're able to get the time. Okay. So should I make a motion? Please. Yeah. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make a motion to appropriate funding so we can participate and share training with the very generous youth commission. Second. Training given by visions. Do we have to do it? See how much? So. Loads of money. We can have a discussion. Loads of money. A maximum of 2,000. A maximum of 2,000, I, I would say. But I would also insert in there that the hope would be that in, in including other departments, we might be able to lower what the right. total amount necessary to bridge the gap because the 2,000 would eat through our training budget. That's right. Um, that would be a maximum. Okay. But I'm hoping if Dr. Kavanaugh joins, maybe she will be able to put some money on the table too. That's what you're responsible. This is what I leave. That's <laughs> 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 what I leave. Your money is your money. Just <laughs> 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 to be clear. <laughs> it's all taxpayers' money, but the bucket of <laughs> your professional development. Just, just a bucket. You think she keeps it in a bucket? <laughs> a bucket and then safe oh. in the back of the admin office. That's right. So Come get some catch on the bucket. Let's go have so lunch. Right so now, the, the motion, <laughs> the motion is looking to be amended to a maximum of two thousand dollars. Yes, that is the right amendment to the motion. Second to the amendment too. All right. So then I would look for a. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And it is unanimous. Uh, thank you very much to the Youth Commission for bringing this uh, thank forward. You. Thank, you. Yeah, thank, thank you. I am too. Much. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. 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 Excited. It's great. It's great. Okay. Thank you. That brings us to uh, an opportunity for public comment. Anybody who would like to make a public comment? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Oh! <laughs> uh, and so if there is no public comment, uh, I'm going to jump ahead to the items by consensus so that when we get to the executive session, we, can, we won't have to enter back into um, public on account of Matt trying to cancel. <laughs> Okay. Um, so items by consensus. As superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to uh, approve the one item by consensus <laughs> as outlined in your agenda. I'm, I motion that we accept that. Okay. Second. Motion by Meg and a second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that uh, carries. So then I would seek a motion then to enter into executive session to comply with or act under the authority of mass general laws for the purposes of discussing strategy with respect to litigation because doing so in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the school committee. I move to do exactly what you just said. <laughs> so a motion by Meg and a second. Second. Second by Amanda and we'll do a roll call vote for this. So I, is it okay if I start down there? Aye. 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 Yes. yes. Yeah. Aye. So we will enter into executive session at 9.02.
and we will um, come back to adjourn at the end, but we will in the meantime be going off air, so I will thank all of our audience at home for tuning in uh, and look forward to seeing people on March 21st at 7 p.m. back at the Hopkinton High School Library for our next regularly scheduled meeting, and we are also posted for this Saturday for the 9th for the focus groups at the high school so that all of us who are able to may participate. So thank you, and with that, we'll move into executive session.